you actually, I mean, you you directed the last eps, uh, installment as well, Regeneration. Right. Uh, and I saw that in this one, you had a hand in co-authoring the, the, the screenplay. And I'm wondering what you wanted to do uh, with the mythology uh, this time around. That well, uh, the, I mean, mythology-wise, I think what we wanted to do was <clears throat> progress the mythology, not change the mythology, just progress it. Um, almost answer the question that the uh, last movie had posed. So, you know, I think that that was important. The the regeneration ended with a couple of um, posing a couple questions, essentially, that Luke Devereaux has kind of escaped and is, is at, out there and at large and dangerous, perhaps. And uh, we've also um, posed the idea that the government has now not only... Um, have they not shut down the program? They have progressed it to the point where it is now involving genetic engineering and cloning. And so mythology-wise, I realized, number one, well, you cannot go back from that. There's no point in regen uh, reanimating dead soldiers if you are able to grow your own. So mm -hmm. first and foremost, we start with that. Uh, secondly, we answer the question about what happened with Luke Devereaux. And then third, we kind of enter this new, uh, we, we kind of introduce this new idea of, well, what if you have um, creations like this that were essentially out in the world operating as, you know, unknowing sleeper agents, sort of Manchurian candidate type of mm -hmm. uh, idea that you introduce to it. And all of these kind of ideas led to the tone of the movie, which is more, uh, of a paranoid thriller, more of a noir, more horror, less, you know, straight up action, you know, I, and when I say action, I mean, the movie has action, but the action genre is usually defined by, uh, is usually defined by a movie where a problem happens at the beginning and the first 10 minutes and the rest of the movie is spent trying to solve the problem. Mm -hmm. um, this one was structured more like a mystery um, movies like Angel Heart, Jacob's Ladder, Memento, movies where your protagonist is uh, going on a journey, a, you know, and your your protagonist, it's an amnesia story, so your protagonist is confused, doesn't know what's going on, and we're not going to leave that protagonist's point of view necessarily. We're not going to give you information he's not privy to. We're going to get the information the way he gets it. And all of this was ultimately to serve the idea that we're going to now tell the story from the perspective of the monster. That's the real victim, you know. Mm. Let's let instead of kind of the MacGuffin of uh, well, the prime minister's children have been uh, kidnapped and we have to go solve the uh, solve that problem. Let's go uh, reanimate some dead soldiers and go solve the problem. Well, I, mean, I remember when I read the first script to Regeneration, that was the storyline. And I remember feeling like whatever crime they're going to solve, even if someone's going to uh, you know, set off a nuclear bomb and kill innocent people, it doesn't compare to the crime of creating your own slave race. So right. suddenly, whatever victims or whoever you're going to feel empathy for, I couldn't help but feel empathy for the, the creations. And so right. to tell a story where now we're in the perspective of the creation and the government becomes – this very mysterious entity that we don't get to walk down the halls of the Pentagon. We don't get to see the war room and we don't see what's on their monitors. We literally, the government is, is represented by just a guy in a suit who comes in and gives us some information that we either believe or we don't believe. And uh, well, it, that was the idea. And, and, and the, the difference in tone that you're talking about between a, a sci-fi action film and something more akin to horror uh, I mean, it's apparent from the first sequence, which is a really, really uh, harrowing sequence that's that's pretty much uh, realized entirely in POV. It's right. the kind of the home invasion murder. Uh, tell me, was that always in the planning to open it up? Because I, I thought that was such a spectacular, visceral opening, to the choice to do it in POV like that. Well, I think... Um the idea of the sequence happened before the idea of doing it in POV, but at a certain point, we decided that 
uh, POV in this movie was going to be used to represent certain things. Um, you know, not it wasn't just a stylistic choice. It was really a thematic and ultimately story choice mm-hmm. because uh, there'll be some other times throughout the course of the movie when you're in POV and when you're there, then then you are going to realize that you are uh, essentially in our in our protagonist's memories, and so that became uh, that became an idea that we arrived upon, and then suddenly that opening sequence became a lot more interesting to me because uh, you could shoot that thing a lot of different ways, and it might just feel very familiar, but to have this you know to have this happen to you. And for you to be in the, literally in the skin of our protagonist, and the only times you see him are at the beginning of the scene when he looks in the mirror, and now you see, okay, you are Scott Atkins. And uh, then after he's received a beating, he looks into kind of a shattered mirror on the ground, and you see the, the damage that's been done from this beating. So I, I think right there, sure, you can create a connection and uh, empathetic connection to a protagonist by shooting it a different way. But I thought it was, uh, I thought it was just a very um, visceral way of experiencing this situation and especially experiencing uh, the reveal of Jean-Claude's character, Luke Devereaux, and to reveal him almost as like this, uh, you know, Alex from A Clockwork Orange when he's, you know, looking at uh, yeah, at the yeah. man who's been gagged and beaten on the ground. I mean, we always kind of thought of that image as sort of that kind of moment where you're looking in the face of, 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 this, of this guy who's, who is about to commit something unspeakable. And that is essentially going to fuel you and your protagonist as you meander your way through this movie. But ultimately, any revenge tale... And this is kind of a, a, a revenge tale with a lot of twists. But any revenge tale is kind of fueled by a crime, and the and the catharsis for that is then going to be the you know the havoc that our protagonist wreaks upon everyone. Yeah, tell me about Jean Claude. I mean, obviously you've worked with him before. I'm sure that you've known him for uh, for many years, probably through your father, I would imagine. Uh, but what, what you know, he's in, he's endured uh, over the over these decades. Uh, he has a very special presence about him. Tell tell me, in your view, as a director, what makes him special? Well, I, you know, the truth is that I didn't know him back when my father worked with him. I was, uh, you know, at that time I was off in college, so I wasn't able to be on the set um, of those movies, uh, when, in Time Cop and Sudden Death, and my dad worked with him. So. I really didn't meet him or ever speak to him until I was about to do Regeneration, though obviously his history with my dad certainly uh, probably warmed him up to me to begin with, and and it was helpful that they had had that experience together. But um, that being said, I think I almost see him differently, and you talk about kind of his enduring power. I think that what I've noticed about Jean-Claude in this stage of his career is that he's much more interesting and much more compelling simply as an actor and as a presence. And, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, in the past it was all about what he could do physically, but, you know, after I saw the movie JCVD, I, I realized, you know, this guy has a real, has a real kind of presence and he's a different, and it's a different kind of presence now than, than it is of the kind of young, uh, you know, martial artist. Now there's this kind of uh, th- there's there's a there's a lot of experience uh, on his face that you look at and is and in his eyes, and I think he brings that all to the table, and that makes him I think much more interesting presence now than he ever has been. Certainly, to I think so, yeah. And and so I, I I think that he's kind of entering a really interesting stage of his career. I think so too. You know, we we've, we've actually talked to your dad twice on the show and and we love him on the show. He came oh, on cool. to talk to talk about one of his films and then he came on for our Stanley Kubrick series that we did too. Um Oh nice. But I, I I would imagine that I mean he he must have instilled a great love of film uh, in you from a young age. Certainly. I mean my, everything I everything that I know I, I learned through my dad. I learned um 
from things that he specifically told me. I mean, you know, questions I have that he answered, but I think I learned more just from observing than anything else. When I was a little kid, uh, I loved being on a movie set from the first time I was on one. Maybe I was, I mean, probably the first time I was on one was maybe three or four years old, but my early memories of being around seven, eight years old uh, when he was making the movie Capricorn One, and, you know, the the rule was always you had to be very quiet. So that was kind of a good thing to follow because you, you didn't talk, you just sat and you watched. And uh, so at first I would kind of stand close to him and close to the camera and close to what was happening there, and eventually you'd start to wander off and you'd start to talk to different people or observe different people doing what they did. I remember on Capricorn One, I spent a great deal of time in the makeup trailer with Mike Westmore, who's a great, great makeup artist and comes from a great family of makeup artists, watching him create uh, molds and making, uh, and in that movie, all the actors uh, at one point are out in the desert, so they have, their faces are chapped, their lips are chapped, they're, they're, they're all cut up. And I saw literally how he was creating these kind of, um, going from clay, you know, kind of sculptures on a mold from a head to taking a plaster mold of that to putting liquid latex in that and then, you know, creating this very convincing makeup. And so my early obsession was was makeup and monster makeup and then Dick Smith and kind of... So I would have these kind of concurrent uh, educations of watching my dad, being on the set, literally watching how he breaks down a scene, watching every element of a shoot, and also where that would take me and my brother in our interests in movies. I mean, making Super 8 movies, watching movies like Apocalypse Now and The Shining and Clockwork Orange and Godfather and Alien. I mean, just the list goes, John Carpenter movies, Mm -hmm. Cronenberg movies, you know, and, and how... And watching movies when I was 10 years old, something like A Clockwork Orange, and then watching it when I was 15 and then 18 and then 20... And just seeing these movies over and over, and the, these movies that endure and that you get something completely different when you see them. When, when I saw Apocalypse Now, when I was, I guess, 10 years old in a movie theater in France, uh, to me it was a great action-adventure movie. Uh, and then when I saw it later on, it meant something, you know, it was a surreal movie. And mm-hmm. uh, every time I watched it, it meant something different to me. And so... I would say certainly my dad instilled a great love of movies in my brothers and myself, and uh, and he inst- he instilled a very critical way of looking at movies. And I think first and foremost, I'm a you know I'm a movie fan, and maybe a movie critic, and then a filmmaker after all of that.